Let me read to you a passage from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 9 to 17. It's the Gospel for the Feast of St. Matthias, the Apostle. St. John writes, Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learnt from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. That's from John chapter 15 verses 9 to 17. It speaks of the love of God. You know, if we are to make sense of life, we have to start somewhere. Do we start with an axiom, a proposition? a wish, a hope, or rather with facts of experience. Some philosophers choose to begin with axioms, propositions, proposals, which, as they regard it, are self-evident, and they construct their system on that basis. Another starting point is to begin with objective facts. I would suggest that there are two great spheres of fact things that are, and moral law, the is and the ought. I'm using the term fact broadly, in the sense that we might say that it is a fact that you must not steal or murder. The ought is as much an experiential fact as the concrete unit. The moral law commanding respect for the life of another is just as real as the chair in which I'm sitting. If the chair breaks, there are real consequences, and the violation of the moral law has consequences that are just as real. The moral law is a fact, but not an empirical fact. Yet for a long time it has been assumed that, in many circles of thought, that the only facts are empirical ones. Moral facts are not accessible by the senses of sight or smell. They are accessible by, by the mind's moral sense, the conscience. Actually, a moral law can be said to be more real than a physical law. If a person is apprehended for murder, the moral law he has infringed is regarded by society as more absolute than a physical law that played a part in this grave infringement. The murderer may have been driven by his hunger to attempt a robbery during which he committed the murder, or by alcoholic drink. Physical factors and laws influenced the murderer, but the moral law prohibiting unjust killing was seen by the courts to be absolute, whereas the physical need for money was not. You should have disregarded the law of hunger, but never the right to life. But let us set aside all such discussion and simply notice the two great objective facts of human experience, that of the ought and that of what is. The moral law is an inescapable reality facing every normal human being, and this moral law comes home to each via that faculty of the mind we call the conscience. There is a dim sense in man that this moral law which dictates that he do this and avoid that has its origin in an ultimate obliger. 
an ultimate superior. Further, man tends to identify the origin of the ought, this ultimate obliger, with the origin, the creator, of all that is. The moral lawgiver and judge behind the dictates of conscience, he takes to be the creator and sustainer of all that is. Let us not here dwell on the logic of all this, for I am merely tracing the elements of man's sense of God. God is viewed as our creator and our lawgiver and judge. He gives us being and the creation around us, and he commands us to act in accord with the moral law. But there is what we might call a deeper yearning of our hearts, and that is for an ultimate love. We might interpret creation around us as tokens of love, and we might interpret the dictate of conscience as a token of a father and friend, but then again we might not. Our moral, intellectual and sense experience may not interpret reality in terms of love. Love could be missed and our hearts left empty. But what has clinched the matter is divine revelation. God has intervened and revealed his personal love for us. He has seen our plight. We are under the oppression of sin, that sin which we have inherited and to which we individually consent. We are enslaved to it just as the children of Israel were enslaved to their oppressors in Egypt. But God has seen us just as he saw them and he sent to us our liberator, Jesus Christ. But Christ has not only redeemed us by his blood, he has chosen to enter into a personal friendship with us. So we are not merely beholden to the God of all that is and the God of all that we ought do. We are beholden to the God who has offered us his love, a love which in Jesus Christ knew no bounds but went to the limits for us and for our salvation. The love of Jesus Christ is a greater fact than any of the basic facts of our human experience. God is much more than we might have expected, basing ourselves simply on all that is and all that ought be. He is the God of infinite love, who calls us to an intimate friendship with him. On this feast of St. Matthias the Apostle, who was one called to an altogether special friendship with the incarnate God, let us treasure our Lord's words in the gospel we heard a little earlier. They are words that offer us the gift of divine friendship and love. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. John chapter 15 verses 9 to 17. There are many elements in authentic religion and we have just considered some of them but the crowning element is love. 